In this video, you're going to learn everything that there is to know about stereochemistry and Fisher projections. By the end of this video, you are going to know what Fisher projections are and how to read them, how to assign the R or S configuration to an asymmetric carbon in a Fisher projection, how to solve relationship problems for Fisher projections. So is the relationship between these two Fisher projections that they are enantiomers, that they are diastereomers, that they are identical, etc. And finally, how to convert Fisher projections to bond line drawings or skeletal structures or the other way around. Fisher projections are one of the many ways that chemists can use to draw or represent molecules. The Fisher representation is useful because it can convey three-dimensional stereochemistry information about the molecule in a simpler two-dimensional flat drawing without the need to draw wedges and dashes. So it's not just a representation that's made up to frustrate and confuse undergraduates, it has a purpose. So if you think about um, molecules like carbohydrates, for example, that can have many chirality centers in a long chain, if you're a chemist that has to deal with carbohydrates a lot of the time and you need to draw them a lot of the time, it's going to be annoying if you have to draw in every single wedge and every single dash every time you need to draw a molecule. So Fisher projections are a much more straightforward way to get that information across quickly. For example, both of these drawings are of a sugar called D-ribose, and from both drawings, a chemist would be able to understand that all of the chirality centers have R configurations. So how do we then read Fisher projections and actually get that 3D stereochemical information out of the 2D drawing? Well, we have to know the conventions of the Fisher projection. Luckily, they are simple. The cross or intersection in the middle of the Fisher projection represents a carbon atom with four substituents coming off of it. The vertical bonds on a Fisher projection are dashes, so the substituents would be pointing away from you and into the page. Horizontal bonds are wedges, so the substituents are coming out of the page as if they are hugging or embracing you like this. So for this simple molecule here, even though the drawing of the Fisher projection is flat, knowing the conventions of the Fisher projection means that we know that the chlorine and the ethyl group are pointing towards us, coming out of the page, embracing us, because they are on the horizontal bonds. And knowing this information allows us to assign the absolute configuration to that chirality center, even though the Fisher projection is drawn as a flat molecule. So how exactly do we do that? Here's how we assign the R or S configuration to carbons in a Fisher projection. We'll start off by giving the four groups around the chirality center their priorities, according to the kahn ingold prelog rules. And if you don't know what I mean by that, check out the video I have on assigning the R and S configuration if you're not clear what I'm doing here. So if the fourth priority group is on a vertical bond, that means it's already pointing away from us, and we usually want that when we're going to assign the absolute configuration. We will look at our priority groups 1, 2, and 3 and trace that circle from 1 through 3, and if that circle is clockwise, that means that from the top it goes to the right, so our configuration is R, and if it's counterclockwise, that configuration is S. So for this molecule, the first priority is the chlorine atom, the second priority is the ethyl group, and the third priority is the methyl group. And if we trace that circle from one to three, we get a clockwise circle. And so the configuration of this chirality center on this Fisher projection is the R configuration. Now, if the fourth priority group is on a horizontal bond, then that means it's pointing towards you. And so you have to remember to swap the rule. If your 1, 2, 3 circle is clockwise, you would normally get R, but you need to switch it to S. And if your 1, 2, 3 circle is counterclockwise, you'd normally get S, but you need to switch it to R in this case. So for this one, the first priority is bromine. The COOH, the carboxylic acid, has the second priority, and the methyl group is third, with the fourth priority hydrogen on a wedge that means it's pointing towards us. So if I trace my 1, 2, 3 circle, I get a counterclockwise, which is normally S, but I must switch it to R because the hydrogen was pointing towards and not away. And so this chirality center on this Fisher projection has an R configuration. 
Let's do another one for some practice. This molecule is drawn as a Fischer projection and it has two chirality centers. One on top connected to a CH3, an H, and an OH, and then one on the bottom connected to a chlorine, a CH3, and an H. So let's start with that top chirality center carbon. The lowest priority will be hydrogen. Then oxygen has the highest atomic number of the substituents, so it's first priority. And then between the two carbon atoms, the one carbon on the Fischer backbone is connected to a chlorine, whereas the other one is just connected to three hydrogens. So the Fischer backbone carbon will be priority two and the methyl will be priority three. The convention of the Fischer projection is that the vertical bonds are dashes. They're pointing away from us. So our priority four hydrogen atom is already pointing away from us. So all we need to do is trace our circle from priority one through three and see which way our circle is going. So I will trace the circle from one to two to three, and that is clockwise. So this is an R configuration for this top carbon here. Now let's look at the bottom carbon. Hydrogen is again number four. Chlorine will be one. The Fischer backbone carbon is going to be two again, and the methyl will be three. And now we remember that the convention of the Fischer projection is that the horizontal bonds are pointing towards us. Our fourth priority hydrogen is on a horizontal bond. That means it's pointing towards us. So we're gonna trace our circle one through three and get our answer, and then we're gonna switch our answer. So we'll start with chlorine, go to the Fischer backbone carbon, and then finally number three, the CH3 group. And that is a right-handed circle or a clockwise circle. So normally that is R, but because the hydrogen was pointing towards us on the horizontal bond, I will switch it to S. So the chirality center on the bottom here, this one is an S configuration. Now, I know you didn't come here because you just are such a big fan of Fisher projections and you love them. You probably came here because you are frustrated by Fisher projections and it's hard to solve problems with Fisher projections on your exams. It's a really common exam style problem to give you a bunch of Fischer projections and then ask you about the relationship between them. Are these two enantiomers? Are these two diastereomers? Are they identical? Are any of them meso compounds? In this section of the video, I'm going to give you some tips about how to approach these types of problems. My first tip is to know how to safely manipulate a Fischer projection. If you're comparing two, you might have to manipulate one of them, so like turn it around or move groups around, so that you can make a better comparison. First, you can turn a Fisher projection 180 degrees in the plane of the page, and the result is that you get the same molecule. It's just upside down. So here's what this molecule would look like if I rotated this Fisher projection 180 degrees. These are two identical molecules. It might seem really obvious to tell you that, but you need to know that 180 degrees is safe because 90 degree rotations are not. They generate the enantiomer, not just an identical molecule. You actually generate the enantiomer if you rotate a Fischer projection 90 degrees. So if I take this molecule here and I only rotate it 90 degrees and I redraw it, I didn't just redraw the same molecule. I drew the enantiomer of the original molecule. This is important to know because it can also help you solve problems. You can also manipulate Fischer projections by rotating any three groups around a chirality center and keeping the other one fixed. For example, on this molecule, I can rotate the H, the OH, and the CH3 around in a clockwise direction. So I'll move the H to the top, the OH to the right, and then that CH3 to the left, and I'll redraw the molecule. And this produces the same molecule that I had before. It just now might be in a better situation to compare it with another molecule on a quiz. And again, you need to watch out because if you swap two groups on a chirality center of a Fischer projection, you are generating the opposite configuration of that chirality center. So for example, if I switch the OH and the CH3 group on the top carbon of this Fischer projection and I redraw the molecule, I have gone from the R configuration on that carbon to the S configuration. And so I've actually generated a diastereomer of the original compound because I have changed one chirality center, but not both. So that's manipulating the molecule. My second tip is to look for symmetry or easy swaps. So for example, let's see if we can spot the difference between these two Fischer projections. 
On the left-hand molecule, the bottom carbon has a chlorine substituent on the left and a hydrogen substituent on the right. And on the right-hand molecule, those two substituents are swapped. The chlorine is on the right and the hydrogen is on the left. So these two molecules have the same configuration of the top carbon and a swapped configuration on the bottom carbon. That means that they are diastereomers. So one configuration has been swapped, but the other one stays the same. That's the diastereomer relationship. We don't even have to assign RNS here. We can just see this easy swap. Similarly, with this pair, we can just really easily see by inspection that both chirality centers have swapped. So that makes these two molecules enantiomers of one another. You can even see that they are mirror images of one another. If we drew a mirror plane right in the middle, you can see that they're a reflection of each other. So they're enantiomers. Here's another similar pair. We can also see in this case that both of the chirality centers in these molecules have swapped. They look like mirror images of one another, so we might say right away upon first inspection that these are enantiomers. But we can also see that both of these molecules have an internal plane of symmetry. So we can actually draw a mirror plane inside the molecule and we get an identical reflection on each side of both of these molecules. So what does that mean? Remember when a molecule has an internal plane of symmetry, that means that it's achiral. And so an achiral compound cannot have an enantiomer. And so that makes these each meso compounds. It means that they're identical to one another. My last tip, and this is especially useful if you have maybe more than two or a whole bunch of Fisher projections that you want to compare, is to just assign all of the RNS configurations to the chirality centers in all of your Fisher projections. So if I did that with this group of four molecules here, I would get RR, SR, RS, and SS. And so with all of those assigned, we can actually see the enantiomer relationships, as well as the diastereomer relationships among this group of compounds. Sometimes the Fisher projection just doesn't work for whatever problem that you're trying to solve, and you'd rather see it as a bond line drawing or a skeletal structure. So here is how you would convert it. First, you're going to count the atoms in the main carbon chain of your Fisher projection, and then you're going to draw the same amount of carbon atoms in a zigzag skeleton for your bond, bond line drawing. Then you're going to draw in the top group and the bottom group at either end of your skeletal structure. Now, this is the funny part. You're going to draw a tiny picture of yourself floating above your bond line drawing like this with your head pointing towards the group that is on the top. And then you're also going to draw a tiny picture of yourself laying below your molecule like this, your head in the same direction. I promise I'll explain what this is for in a minute. Now, I want you to think about yourself looking straight at the Fisher projection. And you're going to imagine that the Fisher projection is like some kind of weird centipede creature with many sets of arms. So each of those horizontal bonds is like a set of arms that's reaching out to embrace you and the top group is the head and the bottom group is the feet. And you are going to have a very fun dance with this weird centipede creature where you are going to dance and grab each of those sets of arms reaching out one at a time, moving from the top set all the way down to the bottom set of arms. Okay, so get ready for your fun, fun dance with this Fisher projection creature. All right, let's start at the top carbon. If I was dancing with this molecule at the top carbon, I would have an OH in my left hand and a hydrogen in my right hand. So imagine now that we're still doing this dance, but we're floating above that first carbon. If I was dancing with the molecule in this view, the OH in my left hand would be coming out of the page on the wedged bond, and the hydrogen in my right hand would be going into the page on the dashed bond. Now, we could also omit that hydrogen atom and leave it implicit, but in this case, since I'm teaching the technique, I'm going to draw all the hydrogens in. All right, so now that carbon is done, our substituents are placed, so let's move down and dance with the next one. So on this carbon, I have a chlorine in my right hand and a hydrogen in my left hand. And so this carbon on our skeletal structure is pointing down. So if we're going to now imagine ourselves dancing with this one, we have to be below the molecule. So the chlorine in my right hand would now be pointing out of the page 
and the hydrogen in my left hand would now be pointing into the page. So on a dash, the chlorine would be on a wedge coming out. So see how easy that was? We've now done another carbon. Okay, so next dance partner carbon, moving down the molecule. We have a right-hand methyl and a left-hand hydrogen, and we are above the molecule this time. So my right-hand methyl is now into the page on a dash, and my left-hand hydrogen is out of the page on a wedge. All right, our final dance partner, I would have an OH in my left hand and hydrogen in my right hand, and now we are below the molecule again. So the OH in my left hand is into the page on a dash, and the hydrogen in my right hand is out of the page. So that is how it's done. This is, of course, not the only way to translate between these representations, but this is the way that I like to do it. So now you know. I will quickly show you that you can do this in reverse as well. Just draw yourself above and below the skeletal structure or bond line structure like you did before, and then count the carbons and draw the framework of the Fischer projection with the same amount of carbons. You add in your top and bottom groups and make sure the top is where you've drawn your head. Then you work down the carbons like dance partners again. This time, you're gonna just imagine what you'd be holding if you were above or below the molecule and then translate that onto the Fischer projection as if you were standing in front of it. And that is it for this lesson. I'll see you in the next one.